It takes a very, very special person to take a crappy situation and reframe it into something positive. Look, I try, but often I am not that type of person. But luckily, I have found someone who is, and I'm so excited to chat to them about it. Hello and welcome. This is Creativity Uncovered. My name is Abby Gatling, and I welcome you to join me on my journey where I uncover how everyday people find inspiration, get inventive, and open their imagination. Basically, in this podcast, I am discovering how people find creative solutions at home, at work, at play, and everything in between. And then my goal for it is that by the end of it, you'll be armed with a whole suite of tried and tested ways to summon creativity the next time that you need it. And today I am speaking with the lovely Lauren Hackney. Welcome, Lauren. Thank you so much for having me today, Abby. I'm very excited to speak with you. Yes. Ah, look, I am really excited about this chat because we had a little bit of a brief chat a couple of weeks ago and I just loved your story (laughs) because uh, especially because when we're talking about, you know, your journey and you said that something along the lines of, creativity saved your life and oh gosh I had to reach out and talk to you about it so let's start there let's tell me what was the lead up to what was the lead up to that well I I guess it's sort of I was living a a very same life for a very long time um for many years I've worked in the same company um I've I've had not like not many changes that way not many big changes in my life until 2020 came along and everyone's got a COVID story um but I worked in aviation and that went nowhere for the first time in 16 years and it was one of those situations where finding a job was really different um you couldn't leave the house all the new platforms like Zoom and LinkedIn I had no reason to be a part of because I was just living in the same company for 16 years, having the time of my life, it was really fun. But then all of a sudden it was, you can't leave the, you can't leave the house and you need to find another job. So I found it really daunting because I, I had so much, so many negative uh, emotions that actually I created for myself in that space where, you know, it wasn't anyone else in my life making me feel bad. I was the one who felt like I felt my family because I wasn't trained in anything else. And I, I didn't know what to do and I felt so lost. Mm. But I guess the only uh, constant that I had was telling stories with my children every night. And I remember feeling so bad for months, like just just months of feeling like when's life going to go back to the life I had before, you know. And the the one thing that I had every night was, well, I, I get to keep telling stories I made up with my children. And these stories have been with us for years. It wasn't until the, you know, the, the lockdowns kind of mild and went mild and we got to go camping within our area. <laughs> like I, I'm in Brisbane, so we were allowed to travel to Stradbroke, which was a whole 40 minutes away. <laughs> and it wasn't until we had a really crappy first night camping. Now, everyone had the same experience here where it was out everyone's first holiday and like, five months so everyone was just so ready for it and the first night it was torrential rain and we didn't know what to do with six families and about 15 children i i thought you know what i'm gonna cuddle the kids together and tell the stories that my children and i made and they were so popular that it wasn't just that night of the camping trip every night for the whole week to our children of our campsite and other campsites want to come in and join in and, and be part of this story so creativity in a part where there was there was so much stress really changed my life because I ended up writing um, and illustrating and publishing that story with my children and it's now sold all over the world. So it's it's one of those things where I urge so many people that if you have if you have a situation like I know what it's like to be living week to week in that situation and not knowing when it's going to stop and and i can even liken it like COVID is well over with that stuff but now it's interest rates and now it's 
I hear so many people being made redundant. And like, we all want to know when this nightmare is going to end, right? I can, I can resonate with that where you can't see an end to this fog. But I, it took a camping trip with my friends who said, what are you doing? You need to, you need to tell this story. This story's fun. And I thought, I'm, I'm really, I'm really glad I pursued it because it's, it's now completely changed my life. Wow. <laughs> that is, that is so crazy. I mean, we hear, we heard like a quite a few stories on the podcast here about COVID has been this kind of catalyst for a brand new direction in life. People, you know, losing their jobs and being forced to find whole new careers. Uh, like, but that wasn't really what you set out to intend at all. You know, you had got yourself another job to, you know, <laughs> feed your family. And this just was you <laughs> making do of a tough situation, <laughs> camping in the pouring rain. That's unbelievable. Yeah, the HMAS Lauren, it was awesome. <laughs> like, <laughs> it, it was certainly, you know, it was one of those nights where you just, you just got to laugh. Like, you Oh, everyone's tents flooded. I remember sleeping in the ute and my kids slept in someone else's tent and it was it was so bad. Um but on yeah, day like, one. <laughs> yeah, but like looking back, it's really funny because at, at the time it's it's really hard to stay positive when you're living in that space. It's really hard to get up every day and, and not well, I found it really hard not to feel like I wasn't failing my family because I really wish I had a backup option. I really wish I was like like it had teaching qualifications or, or, or something else where I could go, right, aviation, it's gone, but I've got this. I, I woke up so many times during that space thinking, oh, God, it's all my fault. I really wish I, wish I had something else to fall back on. And, and like, I found something. I, I ended up helping people in their own homes, like, who, you know, who needed assistance. And it was casual work, but it wasn't solid it wasn't solid work. Like it wasn't like you could, you know, work two months and then have a week off. Like it was, and if a client didn't want you on that day, then you had no work at all. Like it was one of those situations where that wasn't concrete enough for me to relax. And I just remember, I, I remember, you know, sobbing on my way home from work thinking all of my friends, they're, all their careers have gone gangbusters during COVID. Like, do you remember hearing those stories? Mm. And like, and I loved hearing it. Like, I'm, I'm so happy for them. Like, that's great. <laughs> In the meantime, I'm like, I just had to clean up human shit. Um, so, <laughs> and, like, and there's nothing wrong with it. But, like, you know when you go, wow, I'm, I, I felt so lost. But what kind of saved me is at, at night, I, I got my kids together and right, let's let's do this. Let's write this story. And can I can I show you the book? Yes, please do. Because we've now we've got three. It's oh done so God. well that it's grown. But if you see little guys like this, like no no one's going to be at the love or anything in our family, just so you know. Um, <laughs> but like if you see the simplest of drawings. These are all my children. Um, like we would sit together, and I'll see if I can find, like we would just sit together overnight and like, you know, draw little little snippets and think of names for the characters. And the, that it's funny how that is one of the biggest memories now I have of that really crap time. Like when we look back, we don't necessarily think of the times mummy was crying or, you know, Mummy was like stressed. My boys look back and remember those memories on top of all the other ones. Oh. And I'm really glad we did it. Yes, it sounds good. I, I should actually just point out we are putting this on YouTube, but if anyone is listening on Spotify or anything like that, well, we were pointing out with these super cute little drawings that are throughout the book <laughs> that have been so drawn great. by Lauren's kids. And we will put a link away to the book uh, in, in the show notes so you can check it out yourself, but they're really, really cute. And uh, wow, you've said so many great things to send, Lauren. I, there's a lot I want to ask you about, but I want to... Before we talk about the impact that book has had on you and your family, and I actually want to go back a tiny little bit that you were finding this joy in telling these stories with your kids every night and you've been doing that for years and years and years. Is that right? 
Yeah, and since they were about two and four. Wow. Wow. That is such a creative thing to be able to come up with this story. Like, did you have any sense that you were a creative person until? No, uh, like- no I just got bored of what was on TV. I thought it was all rubbish. <laughs> I was like, come on, kids, we can do better than that. Um, no, and like, it, it's because you know how I don't, like in our time zone in Brisbane, right, like, you know, it all wraps up at like 7 p.m. And, and at the time it was this lovely little segment of Giggle and Hoot and it was, you know, some really lovely shows. But when they started getting just that just that tiny bit where 6.37 they were starting to be just that little bit more awake, I was like, right, we're not, we're not going to wait until 7 o'clock. We're going to push our beds together and we're going to, can I tell you what the story's about? Yes, please do. Oh, good. Okay, great. Um, we used to dream that boys had a lolly shop and we would take turns because all the, all the lollies in the lolly shop had magical powers, you see. So we would take turns choosing colours and flavours and then, you know, what would this, mag- what would this lolly do? You know, um, one would make you visible and one would make you swim under the water like a turtle and the other one would like. And my, my son, when he started getting into like year one, year two, he learnt that turtles <laughs> breathe through their butt and like... <laughs> So as as the story grew, like my son, well, both of them would just be like, you know what I learned today? <laughs> um, but, yeah, so so we, after years we had like where the magic came from and this other world of all these other characters of why the magic was brought to our world and how we had to help save this other world. And because when COVID happened, my boys were six and eight, so this was like a four-year-long story. And my husband would work three to four nights a week. So it wasn't just once a week we would tell it. We'd, we'd tell it a lot. Um, and I used to say, tell it to my godchildren when I babysit them. And, yeah, like we've sold other types of stories, but this was the one that was the most popular with our friends. Yeah. And and your sons were contributing to, the, to that story as well. So it was like oh, a yeah. progressive thing. <laughs> yeah, because so I remember cool. when my youngest was in prep, <laughs> and we we're just doing our lolly shop bedtime and he's like mom if i could be invisible i'd disappear in the school photo and i'm like no you wouldn't and like one of the storylines is one of the families in the town is like from a large family and the boy takes the invisible gobstopper and disappears in the family photo and the mum doesn't know until she gets the proofs <laughs> and she gets really angry and so like I don't know whether to be like scared or proud, but that came from my youngest. <laughs> it's, good. it's like it, it is art imitating life. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I could disappear, Mum, I would. Yeah, that's wild. I, and I, I guess, like, what is intriguing to me is that it. I, I already think that so many parents are super creative because you have oh, to yeah. keep trying new things to keep your kids entertained. But the fact that you managed to develop this entire sort of ecosystem of the lolly shop and these stories and these narratives and everything like that that is such a creative thing but it it took for someone else on this camping trip to actually go hey do you know this is actually really good <laughs> yeah because i thought it's just like yeah every parent does it but some of them said oh it's fun and like w- why not like you should write this story so he- here we are yeah, I did that's it. So good. I love it. So, so you're at this camping trip. You're telling these stories, being asked to do it night after night after night. At what point did you think, oh, actually, yeah, I should do something with this? And like, what were the steps that you took after that? Yeah. Um. To be fair, no, it it didn't cross my mind. I love, I love to laugh. It's one of my favorite things. And when I when you have a bunch of kids, just you know, they're honest. Like when a child laughs, it's for real, you know, like they're not lying. And we, at this point, there was no structure storyline. So we just pretended that Stradbroke Island had this lolly shop and like some of them were pretending the fish, like the fish in the ocean became magical. And some of them were pretending that the shells would come to life. Like it was just this wild and you couldn't help but to get lost and want to know what they knew. So, no, I didn't think anything. I didn't. I did not of those nights think, oh, 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 i got to do something with this. I was just purely living in the moment that I was like, wow, this is 
firstly, I'm envious because when you're like close to 40, you're not that happy anymore. <laughs> no, not, well, you are. But like, you know, when you're eight to 10 years old and you've got not a care in the world and all you're doing is laughing with your friends under the stars in front of a campfire, you kind of, I couldn't help but to get lost in that. I just thought that was the best time. And the barge ride home, um, my girlfriends were just going, hey, you've got lockdown still. You, aviation is, international travel's not going anywhere. Piece it together. Write the story. And I did. Um, and then I got rejected by every publisher under the sun, um, which is okay because at the time I was very ignorant and very green and I just thought because everyone loved it, every publisher would love it and it would be snapped up. (laughs) (laughs) And I'm actually really okay with it because having the freedom to do it how we've done it, have it purely our story, like when you read it, You will see, like if you read books one, two, and three, you will see progression of us getting better with our writing. Like you can just, you can just see we're getting better with it. But those three books are purely us and no one else. And when I self publish it, because I got really sad after, you know, (laughs) after after no publisher was interested, Um, you know, my neighbor who knew a retired editor slash you know, minor minor publisher, said, hey, look, why don't I help get you in contact with this person? And, and he did. And she was very strict with me. She said, I'm in retirement. Do not, do not mention my name. If I start receiving manuscripts or, you know, emails again, she goes, I'm not doing it for that. I'm helping you because I like your story. And I went, great. And so she taught me how to do books one and two. And book not, book three, I almost did almost all on my own. I still had to ask some questions. Um, but, yeah, so I, with that, we decided to try and stock it on some of our local books bookstores, you know, around the area. And my children and I started making some really basic homemade ads, which I don't care. They're terrible. But they are so fun. It was so fun. Like, Again, if you said to me in 2019 in November, hey, in four months' time, you're not going to have a job and then you're going to turn into an author and then your books will sell all around the world and then you're going to make some homemade ads for it and it's going to be super fun, I would be, my response would be like, that's not going to happen. But it did. So, like, if you look at where we've come, I know I'm not the most professional of people, but... I'm so grateful we did it and we took a chance because I now have a a YouTube channel where I interview authors and hear their perspectives and illustrators and podcasters and share their knowledge because it's a messy industry publishing. Um, And the Lolly Shop recently has had its first draft of a screenplay being written. Wow. (laughs) I know. Like who knew? Like those words in a sentence, Lolly Shop screenplay. Never thought I'd be saying in my life. So I, I can take, I, for anyone listening, and sorry to get all preachy, but I've been there. I've, I've been jobless. I've, I've struggled to pay the rent. Oh, well, mortgage, I didn't rent. But what I'm saying is I've been there. I've, I remember just being feeling so low and feeling like I didn't have a place and feeling all these things. But then I took a risk and I did something that, didn't quite work out the way it, I thought it would, but it's gone a direction where I'm. I'm so glad I did it. Yes, I mean it sounds like such a journey, you know, from being rejected but just keeping with it. It is wonderful. It's wonderful that you persisted with it. But I do wonder whether if COVID had not happened and you weren't feeling, you know, at the depths of your despair, would you have listened to your friend? In saying, you're saying, actually, you know, there's something here. <laughs> Probably not because, like, I only, I, well, maybe. So the lolly shop story was told to my godchildren and at the time <laughs> their mum, my, my girlfriend who knew me for many, many years, knew that that's just what I always did. So all my friends who've known me for decades never encouraged me to write or to put any stories out there because it's just part of who I was. Like it's. 
I don't know if I'm making sense right now, but um, like, you know, when you just kind of go, oh, yeah, that person cooks really good. doesn't mean you're going to say you should be a chef, mm. um, you know. So they've always known that I love to engage with children and, you know, I tell my stories to anyone at the time that was close to me. Um, but it's funny how life throws things at you that forces you to be in a situation because within the same 12 months of losing my job, I almost lost my husband. Mm. Now, when when going back to your question of do I think I would have done this, if, if COVID didn't happen, I probably wouldn't have written the lolly shop because I didn't think it was anything special. It was just something I did. But then when my husband almost died of a heart attack and we've been down this road before, like he's he's got a bad heart, it's just something we deal with, um, I wrote a lot of how I felt down. And I reckon because that happened and I started writing and putting my feelings out um, and then eventually I made a story out of that, my girlfriend said to me, you know, why don't you publish it? I like it. It's really good. And it turns out lots of other readers have thought it's really good as well. So it's funny when life has thrown one, hold on, is this a, is this a PG podcast? <laughs> <laughs> go for it, go for it. I was about to say, when life throws one shit storm at you and you think you <laughs> nailed it, that happens. And it's almost as if, like, I had two opportunities for life to fall apart and me to write about it or me to do writing about it. Um, because, and, like, I don't know. I hope that made sense. Oh, I, um, yeah, I think it's so interesting that, you, that the writing has been sort of your... Um, healing process it seems oh, yes 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 yeah <laughs> i can't tell do you agree with me i can't tell <laughs> i'm subtle <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> I, I i think that's wonderful that you know you've got, obviously it's been kind of cathartic for you if you're writing about your husband and your story there as well that's yeah that. but yeah, it's funny because, like I say to so many people, you don't have to write to become an author, but it's it's interesting how just getting your thoughts out can help. Um, it wasn't until months and months and months later I discovered that there's a thing called journaling, um, which which was what I was doing. Um, and and again, I, whew, I, we had to, yeah, you know, when you think life's bad and then you go, damn, like could have been a widow that night. <laughs> Mm. Um, you just, you just kind of go, I don't know what the link is. I'm not a professional psychologist. I'm I'm not a professional counselor, but there's definitely something there where I found just writing, getting my thoughts out and just, that was the time. And then when my head was a bit clearer, putting it into some sort of story, um, it helped. And I, I just, I urge others to do it. Because that's a creative outlet as well. Like, sure, there's no illustrations there. God, thank God for that, right? You don't want that illustrated. <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I urge so many people, just write it down. You don't have to do it to get published. Just see what see what it does for you. Absolutely. Lean lean into it if you're getting those, those urges. And so what has the impact been on writing, the lolly shop that's your that's been the impact on you for right doing your journaling and that's amazing what's the impact been on the the lolly shop on your relationship with your kids and 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 covid and all those types of things yeah for sure my relationship with, with the lolly shop has been sort of the the beacon of hope because it kind of was a constant where i love to keep playing with it my children at one point got a little sick of it um, I think because they then started, we started going to schools and we started, the, the local bookshops were stocking it. And one, uh, you know, my local bookshop wanted a, an author appearance one day and then naturally my children were expected to be part of it. And there's certain things when the kids are only six and eight, they that stuff can be quite scary. So it, it, the relationship with the lolly shop, making it public, putting it out there, um, and then having children like give their uh, sort of feedback to my own kids was really interesting as well. So I guess it's the, I guess the fact that it's part of us now. 
um, has been really good because they're, they're back on board with it now that they're, you know, 12 and 10. And they, they love to still create with it. It's just getting a little bit older with the storyline. So, you mm. know, they're growing, the story's growing. Yes, yes. And, you know, I mentioned before about the reframe. It seems that though, like, during this tough time that both you and, and your family were going through, this writing has helped you kind of remember that time in a, in a different way. Would you say that's right? Absolutely. It's funny when you look back, the memories we have, uh, like the losing of the job and me crying a lot, those memories were nowhere near as bad as my boys with what they had to see with their dad. And I don't want them to, I don't, I don't I'm not trying to get them to forget any of it. Like we we're dealing with it on, in a very healthy way. Um, but when they look back, it's just more like an extra layer that they have to refer to. And they don't refer so much as, oh, COVID was the time where, um, you know, they don't talk about being stuck at home and bored a lot because we had creating of the story and stuff. So as much as there were times they they were sad, they couldn't leave the house and there's only so much Lego, you know, they could play with before they got bored of that. Um, it seems like, though, that adding that extra layer of memories is what they kind of look back and see. I, I I think that's beautiful. I think that's really beautiful. And I've heard that a few times with COVID that some people found it to be a terrible, terrible time. It Obviously, it, it was for so many people, but some people found the light in that situation of, you know, being at home and being able to spend this extended time with your kids that you just would never have if you're working these crazy long hours and your regular paced life. Um, and I feel like that sort of happened here as well, but you've got the addition of creating this brand new thing together that you will always be able to keep growing together. That's, that's yeah. wonderful. Thank you. Yeah, no, you're exactly right. And we hope to keep going with more stories down the track. Yeah. So you've, so you've now got three books in the series and you yes. mentioned a screenplay. Tell, tell me about how did that happen? <laughs> I'm going to feel like a nutter if nothing happens of it. Um, yeah, so uh, I guess because um, the Lolly Shop won a uh, an award last year, it was a Story Monsters Honourable Mention for Middle Grade Fiction. Oh, congratulations. Um, and thank you. Um, I guess that made uh, people look at it even more. There was a screenwriter here in Brisbane who said to me, this would translate fantastically. To the, to, to the screen. Um, I had to, to pick my jaw up from the ground because, again, um, it's those little things that happen along the way where you just go, I never thought, I never thought that would happen ever. So uh, it, it was that chance as well where we had a meeting through Zoom and the screenwriter said, hey, this is the, this is the time where you can actually look at kind of rewriting your first book if there's any part you want to add or not because this was created at a time when my boys were six and eight and because they're a little bit older now they also kind of had added a few little bits and pieces so the screenplay that is kind of the first draft's finished and you know we're going to have a look at it and see how it all fits the really cool part is it's like a a snapshot of their ages you could say like if you read the first book, you can clearly tell that they are young kids. And my eldest, who's now in year seven, has added just a few little tweaks where you can see, okay, yep, the kids are getting a little bit a little bit old now. There's a little bit more depth to that character uh, when you read the story. So, yeah, well, I don't know from here if the screenplay will ever get picked up. I, I Who knows? But it's it's been a, a layer of this story I never thought would happen. Yeah, <laughs> it's it's crazy. I mean, I just keep thinking back to what you said before. You know, if, you, if it was twenty nineteen, you told me this would happen, I wouldn't believe you. <laughs> it's what a wild journey, a and it sounds um, it sounds lovely that your kids are still include like involved in the writing of it, and they want to be part of its future. Do, do you think that they? 
are seeing themselves as authors? No, because it's funny because um, we see ourselves as more like, you know, storytellers. Um, and because, like, I still I still find it hard to say I'm an author. That's weird, hey. But it's I guess it's the the title I've associated with it is, you know, I tell stories with my kids. Um, but I'm hoping, I'm hoping they continue because story is so important. Like, let's face it, everyone loves a good story. And whether my kids one day want to start screenwriting or want to write their own books, it would, you know, it's, it's a, definitely a path that's available to them. But what I'm hoping is, is that if they ever have children, they can, they can start this legacy with their own kids or their godchildren or their nieces and nephews or however that looks because that's how it started for us i'm hoping that now this is an option for them to continue doing that mm, i love that word legacy because it is is it that you've crafted this story that you've handed down to your kids they've become part of it now you know their friends are becoming part of it and maybe the next generation it's this beautiful thing that it's it, you've started this snowball rolling down a hill and no one's going to be able to stop it. <laughs> I think that's so cool. And I, I also think it's interesting, though, that, you know, maybe it just a twinge of imposter syndrome is coming in that you're saying you don't feel like you're an author. Do you now feel that you're a creative? Yes. Yes, because okay. I, I feel like a bit of, you know, Lauren Unleashed because I have my own... <laughs> YouTube channel where I can I can sort of put the graphics in how I want to and I, and I love showing off other people's books like I've always loved story always not necessarily books but also movie shows like just story in general and all the authors that I interview I love showing off their stories because they're so important and also knowing how they got to where they are so when I get to you know, have them in the hot seat, ask them lots of questions. I like the creative side of it where, you know, I can ask whatever question I, I want to know what I want to know, but then also, you know, put in these interesting little graphics to to keep it creative. So, so yeah, definitely a, a creative on some level. That's wonderful. And so now is writing going to be your new career? Oh, we can only hope. Yeah. Um, I love it. I have so many stories rolling around in my brain right now. Um, and I do. I love to get up early. I love to get it all out. And some of them are still my boys' stories. Like, yeah, I, <laughs> I can't take credit for all of them. Um, but just to wall, strike while the iron's hot, right, like they're still young enough. My 10-year-old's imagination is, one for a better word, lucid. Um and so, you know, when you go, you're not going to remember that forever. So why not record as much of it as you can? Like, sure, I'm still submitting to publishers, still getting rejected by publishers, but um, I want to hold on to those stories because before you know it, those stories are a thing of the past. Mm. Oh, yeah. I, th I think it's really wonderful. I wish that I captured more of our my family stories because there were so many, so many rich stories as a kid. And I just think it's wonderful that you've actually gone ahead and actually done it. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, COVID. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, thank you. Um, thank you so much for sharing your story with me. I, um, I've absolutely loved it and I, I love that sort of arc of not feeling like you're a creative to now being wholeheartedly, yes, I am a creative I think it, it. I think it's going to be a, a really uh, good inspiration to the people tuning in because you know it, anyone anyone can do it if you try. If, I just think it's fantastic. Thank you, Abby. And you know what the worst thing is? Mm. Not doing it. Like that's the worst. So even if you don't, even if it doesn't look how you think it looked, you may not get what you ordered in the brochure. But if you try, you'll get something even just a small change. So not doing it is the worst. Mm, yeah. And I think uh, with your story, you know, you didn't really set out to be this world famous author or anything with it. You, you just lent into taking that next step. And that's such a great approach to, to this type of thing because you're, that means that you're enjoying the journey and not just endlessly pursuing a specific outcome. Yeah. Yeah, just be just be open to 
whatever you get back, whatever change you make. Like it, it doesn't have to be a big change. The smallest of changes can cause cause ripples down the track. So I urge anyone out there, what's in your imagination and just give it a go. Oh, beautiful, beautiful. I um, will pop the links to your where people can buy your books and um, to your YouTube channel as well because I think that's a really interesting thing that people would love to check out. But, yeah, thank you again for joining me today. And um, thank you to everyone who's actually tuned in to Creativity Uncovered I hope that you enjoyed this episode as much as I have. Um, and if you did, please do jump onto Apple or Spotify or wherever you're listening to this and feel free to give us a rating or a review or a comment because uh, that just helps other people find this podcast and, and share our message a little wider. Um, and as always, please do get in touch if this has inspired you or you want to share your story. And uh, until next time, take care. If you've made it this far, a huge thank you for your support and tuning into today's episode. Creativity Uncovered has been lovingly recorded on the land of the Cubby Cubby people, and we pay our respect to elders past, present, and emerging. This podcast has been produced by my amazing team here at Crisp Communications, and the music you just heard was composed by James Gatling. If you liked this episode, please do share it around and help us on our mission to unlock more creativity in this world. You can also hit subscribe so you don't miss out on any new episode releases.